true story happened when I was not 7, 14, 28, but 16. I was a punk rocker at the time, with spiky hair, destroyed t-shirt, distressed trousers, and Crass had come to play the local town hall. Now, uh, Crass were the punk band of the hour. The enemy at the time described them as the band whose name is on the back of every black leather jacket. Or in my case, brown hooded raincoat. <laughs> if you're not aware of the work, it sounded like this. It was real sort of three chord thrash, anarchy, agit prop, angry stuff. <laughs> the Godfathers of Krusty. They put out a 12 inch 45 RPM EP with 20 tracks on it. I bought it having never heard it. Thought it was an album, so I took it home, played it at 33, but was so desperate to be here. I persuaded myself I liked it, even at the wrong speed, and actually went to school the next day saying, oh, there's a great band called Crash. Yeah, they've got some fierce songs. One of them goes, Yes, that's right. is dead. <laughs> My other ambition at the time was I wanted to be a music journalist, and ambition dealt a severe blow by the fact that the last train home to a village within walking distance of the village where I lived was at quarter past ten at night. So I used to have to like go to all these punk gigs and leave after the second song. <laughs> the night Crass played, however, I wasn't sorry to do this because um, there was always a lot of trouble between skins and punks in, in my hometown, yours too probably. And sure enough, Crass are halfway through the first song and this skinhead is jumping up and down on my shoulders, kneeing me in the back in time for the music. Now, I've always thought that what I'd done was that I'd gone, Fuck off, skinhead. And like walk casually around to the back of the hall. But it wasn't until I came to write this that I realised that what I'd actually done was to go... <laughs> Truly, as they say, the unexamined life wasn't worth living. So there I am, alone on the train platform at a quarter past ten, waiting for the Titfield fucking Thunderbolt. <laughs> Meanwhile, sat who's like the local punk hero, and these two skinheads came down as well. And I knew Sack because he used to skateboard as well, so I was talking to Sack and deriving much kudos there from. And uh, Sack and the two skins, with me tagging along, going to the uh, waiting room, and they start smashing up. Now, not only was I not involved in smashing up the waiting room, but there was a suited commuter uh, standing just outside. And I didn't want him to be frightened, so I made you know, a light-hearted remark. Although, again, it wasn't until I came to write this that I realised he would have been much more frightened at the sight of some skinny 16-year-old punk going, The state of youth today. <laughs> Someone called the police, there's no way to run, it's all chain link. So I went and stood as far away from the others as I could, and I tried to stand in a sort of a, actually, I'm doing three A-levels kind of a way. <laughs> would have got away with it as well, but then suddenly, with the insolent logic of nightmare, one of the two skinheads chose that moment to come and stand next to me, you know, just as the police arrived, going, all right, mate, all right, how you doing, all right? Yeah, cool, yeah. <laughs> so we all get arrested. PC Stevens takes my statement, and um, I'm allowed to go without any charge being brought, technically known as being refused charge, on the grounds that I've liberally grasped up everyone I was arrested with. <laughs> Now, when you're arrested as a minor, they can't just let you go, so I had to phone my mum from the police station. It's one of those calls in life. You know. Hi, mum. Hi. Um, can, you, can you pick me up? I've, I've missed the last train. No, I can't walk. I've, I've pulled a muscle in my leg. Where should we meet? Good question. Um, uh, you're coming from what, the old town by the big roundabout? Tell you what, mum. Um, what's the name of that big municipal building? By the way, what is that? Is it a police station? Yeah, I, I can't, no, I can't actually meet you outside the police station. I'm not, not outside. And then my mum made one of those noises mums make in those situations. You know that one that sort of, oh. <laughs> like, my son, the drug dealer, oh. <laughs> So I'm in the waiting room by the desk sergeant. Meanwhile, Crass have been arrested. A punkette was getting beaten up in the mosh pit. Steve Ignorant lead singer of Crass, bravely dived straight in and ironically got charged with an affray himself. So there's me in all my punky gear and there's Crass looking all this it and my mum walks in to pick me up. <laughs> looking that day like the poshest mum in the world, like a matching coat and handbag, just to show we're not part of the criminal classes, dear. <laughs> so picture the scene 
and pity me, there I am, and punk rock's so important to me, and all my punky gear, and there's Crass, and I have to walk out behind my mum, past Crass, <laughs> as I do level with the band, lamely. Desperately, I tried one last half-hearted punky sneer. <laughs> to no avail. My country lane credibility was in tatters. A return to skateboarding inevitable, when suddenly a door opened, and from out of the cold new town night came my salvation. In walked Crass's mums. <laughs> Now, that, that last bit wasn't strictly true, you know. They didn't, they didn't, <laughs> they, they didn't actually walk into that moment. I was, I was embarrassing slightly. <laughs> I was embarrassing slightly, if you were point. <laughs> so, as the day of the trial got nearer, I thought, I can't go, you know. That statement I've given drops everybody in it, and. Uh, you know, I'd never been arrested before, so I was frightened. I wouldn't have said those things otherwise. And, and it's wrong to grasp up your friends. I mean, even though, technically speaking, these people weren't actually my friends, they were still, you know, very violent people. So, on the actual day of the trial, I had a brainwave. I thought, I won't go. Criminal genius that I fucking am. How can they send you down if you're not at the fucking trial? It's been staring me in the fucking face. I spent the whole day living in the corners of my eyes, dodging invisible policemen. Got to midnight and nothing happened. And then nothing happened the next day, or the next. Then one day, I'm just turning the corner into the street where I lived, in time to see a detective inspector leaving in a police car. And he'd been talking to my mum for an hour in the kitchen. And what he said changes the whole nature of this story. Still felt like I was on a roll as I turned that corner, though. You know, even though it was pure fluke that I'd missed this detective inspector, I felt like I'd been there with him and my mum in the kitchen all the time, wearing like a, you know, I, th I thought it was a scarlet pimpernel. You've got to understand. I felt, I, was, I felt like I'd been there with him and my mum in the kitchen the whole time, wearing like a red frock coat and a tri coloured hat, going, who knows where he can be? <laughs> this Robert new man. <laughs> An inspector called, and what he said was one of those times when it's as if an invisible hand taps the director of the film of your life on the shoulder and is quietly substituted with some other director with a much darker pitch. What he'd said was that they'd been pegging the whole case on my statement. And because I hadn't turned up, Sack and the two skinheads had got off. But subsequently, one of the two skinheads had been murdered on the London Underground. And that wouldn't have happened if I'd gone and given uh, my statement. And I thought, you know. They always say you shouldn't grasp, but if I had have done, you know, if I had have just gone straight to the court and just accurately and truthfully told what I saw, then maybe that Skinner would still be alive. You know, I'd be dead, but <laughs> he'd still be alive. And I felt guilty about this, and it wasn't a guilt I could share with anyone, because everyone knows what it's like to wish, oh, if only I hadn't grasped that person up, because maybe they took a hiding. But no one knew what it was like to wish, oh, if only I grasped him up. You know, so all I could do was keep rerunning the scene in my mind, only this time I grasped him up and I don't feel so guilty, this intolerable burden of guilt, wishing if only I grasped him up, if I had the opportunity again, I would, then I wouldn't feel so guilty. Why I'm telling you all this is I, I want you to understand exactly why it was that I did what I did when, a few years after these events, I found myself in a pub in Birmingham and I happened to overhear six Irishmen talking. <laughs> in, in, in what I took to be a suspicious manner, and exactly why it was that both then and also when I overheard four Irishmen talking in a pub in Guildford, I wasted no time in going straight to the authorities. I thank you. <laughs>